morning. The scripture reading this morning would be in the book of Matthew. If you could open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 22. And we will be reading verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And the church said, Amen. Thank you, Phil. Lots of good things coming up. I'm excited about the marriage and family seminar next week, so... That'll be a good thing. Bring your wife, see if you can straighten her out. <laughs> and she'll be bringing you, so, you know, that's the way that works. We always come for the other person, right? So, hopefully that'll be a very great time of learning and understanding, and uh, we'll all be getting along better by next week. Uh, the passage that we're looking at today, um, I don't know how to introduce this whole thing, but this is one of those things that uh, I've, I guess I've come to that seems very, very important right now. Um, part of this I did at Angel Fire, and part of it I wanted to share with you, but I had a lot longer there, so if you've got an hour and a half, we'll be good. Uh, but since you don't have that, I've cut it down some, and we'll see if we can't do some pieces to this. Um, but this passage is a very interesting passage. And a lot of times this passage is what's picked up by a whole lot of people in the church is saying, oh, there it is. Here's all of it. It's the whole thing. It's the summary of everything that there is. We should love God and love your neighbor, and, and that's all that there is. And that has even gotten taken further that, you know what, there's really nothing else that we have to do. Just love God and love your neighbor, and that's the only thing God required, because it's in red, right, in your Bible? Not here, I should have put it in red. But it's, it's what God said. I mean, this is Jesus' very words. This is what we're supposed to do. But realize, when he says this, he is not talking to his disciples, he is answering a question by one of the Pharisees. And as he answers a question by one of the Pharisees, it's which is the greatest commandment of the law. Well, these two are greatest commandment of the law, he says. They do not have to do with Christianity. They are greatest commandment of the law. Now, in saying that, that's not really what I mean, because of course they have to do with Christianity, because he's saying this. And certainly, love is part of Christianity. But this question that he's answering is, it's a law question. So, it's not even in the original 10. It's out of Deuteronomy 6.15 and Leviticus 19, or 6.5, excuse me, and, and Leviticus 19 and verse 18 and those two commandments he says that's kind of a summary of where God was going with law and yet none of those things are really commandments they're more like principles and so he's giving you the commandments that would seem very much like principles so love God completely everything that you've got love others that's what's most important for them and it's really what he's trying to get at is, I want you to build this relationship with God. I really want you to be able to have this great relationship with God. And this is the principle behind all the rest of the laws. And we find that a lot of times when you look at law, they're stated in a certain specific way, wanting a certain specific behavior. 
but they're usually based on a certain principle. And so the principle that you're trying to get at is behind all of these things. Certainly this is the principle of, of being able to love and to have this relationship with God. And so that's what he wants is this great relationship. But how do we build this relationship with God? How do we get that great? Well, some people will take that verse and say, well, we're just going to give God a big hug. That's all there is to it. We're just going to think of, of hugging God all day long. And so therefore, everything will be fine and wonderful because it's all about love. Okay. Other people will go completely to the other side. You know what? It's all about obedience. If you do what God said, then that's love. Jesus even says that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, right? And so it's all about commandments, and it's all about obedience, and it's all about doing those things. And others will say, well, it's a principle. Is it just following a principle? But a lot of times we assume it's one of these. We assume it's something like obeying what God said. Jesus, I don't think, is trying to give this as a law here, but certainly it is a principle. It is something he is trying to say. It does get recorded in Matthew. It does talk about kingdom people, and so should we do it? Sure, we should do it. I mean, we ought to love God with everything that we have, but it doesn't really tell you the how, and law usually tells you the how. What I want you to do to obey. But here he says, love God with all your mind. So if you think real hard about God, is that how you do that? How do you love God with your mind? I'm doing it now. Can you tell? <laughs> Can God tell? Is there a punishment if we don't? All of these things kind of get into how do we approach God? How is it that we're supposed to approach God? And sometimes we make it so simple today, and some people make it so complicated today. So I'll, I'm going to go right in between both of those. So if we go back and look at the beginning and look at how early people did this, exactly what happened and how did God bring about relationships that he had with those people earlier? Was he happy with them? Was he unhappy with them? How do we look at some of those things? And I think that may give us some benefit from looking at it, but at the same time, be careful with that because they lived in a different culture. They lived in a different world. And so you can't always apply everything there. So the first relationships that you see are because of creation. God created this person, and of course they're going to worship God. You created me. You gave me this great garden. Their kids are going to worship God because, after all, God created mom and dad. And I think that's where Abel comes from. He says, look at all the great things that God has been able to do. We're, you know, we're not in the garden, according to Abel. Adam may realize we've been put out of the garden. But besides the don't eat of the fruit and that tree in the middle of the garden, there really hasn't been any more rules. And so if there are no rules... How do you love God? What do you do? Well, there just aren't any rules. We find them worshiping, and it gets to be a contest between Cain and Abel, although there's not been stated any rules. So he says, well, how would you worship God? And one of them did very well, and one of them not so good, and then the jealousy and all of that. By the time you get to Noah, there's still no law. There's still nothing said, but as Noah comes out of the ark, they have a couple of things. He says, I don't want you to eat blood, and I don't want you to kill. And, and so we get those two coming out. You get the rainbow as the sign of the covenant that I'm not going to destroy the earth with water. And there are certainly relationships that are by faith at this time. And so that's the thing that we seem to be recorded the most is... We see men of faith. Enoch is one. He's mentioned as being a man that follows God. We don't know much else about him. Job lives back in this time. And so certainly Job is a man who loves God, follows God, tries to worship God without a law. He just decides I'll sacrifice every day in case my kids did something wrong. 
but then you also see how that whole test goes with Job and God bragging to Satan, oh, did you see Job? Yeah, I don't want to follow that one. I want to follow a different one. I, but at the same time, you have people of faith. You have people who follow God. You've got Abraham, who is a man of great faith, and he's there to be able to follow God. It's all about what he believes. He believed God about his children, that they would be like the stars of the heaven, even though he doesn't even have the first one. And it's been years and years and years, and it seems like I'm not going to ever have any. But you know what? He still believes. And so God calls that righteousness because he believes so much and Abraham's given a promise not a law and so there isn't really anything to obey there are certain things that God will say when he comes and he says I want you to sacrifice your son well that's even more confusing because now God tells him to do something that's absolutely wrong according to the coming law wrong according to any moral code that we would have or that we would know about wrong in so many ways and so God is saying I want you to do something wrong for me well Abraham doesn't seem to question that he says God I believe that there is something that you understand here that I don't scripture gives us this idea that Abraham then believes resurrection is possible it's not a simple okay I'll do whatever you say like it's a law I didn't like that kid anyway it's not that type of thing but it's a matter of him believing in what God says certainly that's not one we want to follow don't sacrifice your kids okay no matter what they're like then you get Babel there's no law against building towers there isn't anything wrong there is nothing stated that says you can't build a tower somewhere and you can't make a city and you can't all be together and so there's no punishment from God in this but it's just a matter of saying you know what I'm just going to confuse their language and that's all he does and that kind of scatters them out everywhere because if you can't talk to each other then we're going to go somewhere where we can and so they tend to go and they talk to each other now it's not that there were not laws at this time Hammurabi's code is one of the most famous ones it is long before Moses ever comes along and so other nations did have laws there are just no laws from God this makes sense okay so they might have made up their own things that would be considered good but there is no law from God. There is no standard. There is nothing that we are to live to or that we are to do. It's just a matter of what do you believe God wants. It's called faith. And so that's what we see happening. And there were people of principle, people of faith, who naturally did some things right. And so you can see all of these people as you're looking at this, but there is still no law yet. Joseph brothers decide to not treat him well, to be very violent with him and to sell him. Is there a law against selling your brother? No. There should be, I guess. Well, but it's the little brother, so maybe not. Joseph, when he gets to Egypt, Potiphar's wife says, Joseph. I want you to come lay with me. And Joseph says, no, I'm not doing that. Runs out and gets put in prison. Well, was it wrong? There is no law that says it's wrong. But somehow he knows this is not pleasing to God. This is not what I'm supposed to do. This lady's already married. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And you see this recognized between different people. Abraham with the king of Egypt even as he goes down will tell Sarah oh, say you're my sister because I don't want us to be, be in trouble and him kill me in order to get you and so he almost takes her into his harem and, and both of them recognize that's wrong we're not doing that but there is no law from God okay 
God is not treating us as if there are laws to follow because you have people following God already. They do it by faith. And so law isn't really needed if everybody's doing things right. If you have kids at home, do you go in and give them the list of rules or do you wait until they do something wrong? Well, you might go in and say, okay, I'm going to give you all the rules of the house. There's 4,986. And you can go through one by one covering every situation. And, or you can just say, you know what? There's going to be a relationship. A father, son, mother, daughter. And I want you to learn how to act and how to behave and how to do these things. And so you just do it as you go along. And it's not a matter of, of saying, well, there's these things that you have to do. But there does come a time when we get to law. And the first one is the law of Moses. And... He gives the Ten Commandments from the top of the mountain with everyone able to hear, and then there comes a total of, I think it's 623 commandments. Law looks something like this. If you have a stove in your house and you say to your child, don't touch the stove, right? Because there's hot things on the stove, you can burn yourself. So the principle is safety. I don't want you to burn yourself. So don't touch the stove. Simple enough, right? And the kid will never touch the stove again, right? Yeah. Okay, you're going to have to watch him and remind him over and over again, now don't touch the stove. But that's what a law is like. You could explain to him, and most people do, with the principle, the stove is hot. The stove will burn you. Don't touch the stove. There's the law. The principle is, I want to keep you safe. I don't want you to be harmed. And so don't touch the stove because it will burn you. Now, there are people of faith that are found within this time of law. And I think we are able to see that over and over again. David even says, I love the law of the Lord. But you've got to realize David's a man of faith. And for David as a man of faith with a relationship with God, when he looks at the law that God had given, he says, I find God loves me in this law. Now, a lot of other people didn't find that at all in the law of Moses. In fact, Jesus, along with the Pharisees, found something very, very different in the law of Moses. The people were using it not as a way to find the expression of God's love, but more as a way to find Here's what we have to do, and we can condemn everybody who doesn't. And so David says, I love the law, and his faith allows him to relate to God on a different level, even within law, if that makes sense. Because there was no law until Moses. And that law was given to Israel, to the people who were Jewish, and it was not given to you or me unless you happen to be Jewish today. So God never gave us any law, ever. Not in all of the history. Because no matter what, if we just said, you know what, I'm going to take that law as mine, he says, no, you're not. Not unless you're going to become one of those, and uh, you have to go through circumcision, a seal of the covenant, all this, in order to become a person like that. Now, you could do that. But all that's just to say, it was not given to you. It is not yours. Okay. Why was there ever a law given? Well, I'm glad you asked that. So if you go to Galatians in chapter 3, he says, why then the law? It was added because of transgression, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, 
so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Interesting, huh? It was given because of bad people. It was not given to good people because they don't need it. They're already doing things right. But it was given because of sin. It was given to make sin sinful. It was given in order that people might know what was wrong. And they were added because of transgressions. That's exactly what it says. The law was to show sin as being wrong. Because now you've got a commandment that says, thou shalt not worship other gods. And okay, we just happen to have a golden calf here. Well, is that breaking a law? Yeah, that's breaking a law. But they should have known this already to naturally follow the God that led them out, but they seem to not be able to understand. Okay, so law was shown to be sinful. Uh, we don't want to do what the law says. And as soon as you tell me I can't do something, that's the very thing you want to do. Trust this out on any two-year-old. They don't want to have what's over there, the red thing, until you say, now don't touch that red thing. And they're going to head straight for it. Why not? Why shouldn't I touch it? I should be able to touch it. Let me go figure out what that is. We happen to have a green one over here. Why can't I touch that? And then you get the, the eyes. I'm just, I'm not touching it yet. I'm not touching it yet. And sure enough, you haven't moved yet. So then they're going to grab it up and go, I got it. I got what they did. And then, you know, the spanking starts and everything else at my house. So <laughs> because they wanted to touch it, but they didn't want to touch it until you told them not to. So why is that? It's just something that's kind of built into us. And that's what he tries to explain in Romans 7. He says, you know what? It's, it's the way that that we think and it's so law doesn't do something good there in fact law does something harmful to us because we didn't even want to sin until they told us that you know we couldn't have it and then okay now I want it and I've got to have it well that doesn't help us either by defining what's wrong and what's right I've heard that a lot. I've even thought that a lot. You know, if you just tell me what's right to do and what's wrong to do, then it'll be clear and I'll know what I'm supposed to do. And it'll be easy. And I'll do all the right things and I won't do all the wrong things. <laughs> You're not going to. Because as soon as they tell you those things are wrong, well, they didn't even look good before until now you tell me. And all those things that you're supposed to do, you know, make your bed wash the dishes, take out the trash. Yeah, I know. You don't rush in with joy saying, oh, I want to do this so much. For some reason, it just doesn't happen with us. Well, what about principle? Does principle look e any better? You want a clean house. That's the principle. So let's clean up the dishes. They've been sitting there for three weeks. You need to get some of them clean. Let's put up all the stuff. Let's do all that. That's the principle. Does that help? Does that work for you? That's great if it does. But a lot of times it's got to be somebody else says, you know, mainly your wife, the trash needs to be emptied, right? How did she know? We don't follow the principle much better. Now, if you're a man of faith, I think you do. Because they understand the principle and what it's about. But it's not just because, oh, well, there's a principle. I obviously want to follow a principle. It's more because of the faith that you have and the way that you deal with that. He goes on from there, and he says, Now, before faith came, we were held captive under law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. What does he mean before faith came? There was faithful people way back there. And, And yes, there were. Abraham and Job and Enoch, we already talked about them. There were men of faith who lived long before faith was ever explained. And that's what he's trying to get at here. Before faith was explained so that people could be able to believe it, law was given as a guardian to say, you know what, if you don't have faith yet, if you don't believe anything yet, then here's what is good, here's what is not, and I want you to follow those things. And so law was given to people who were coming out of Egypt who had no faith of their own, who did not believe, who were in great fear and could not find God. And in that situation, okay, give them the rules. Because until you get to faith, this is where you start. And so that's where they started. But now that faith has come, you are no longer under a guardian. And the way he puts it here, now that faith has come, you are no longer imprisoned. You are no longer tied up. You are no longer held captive. All of those are what he describes this as because you cannot do all the things of God when you have this and when you don't see this. Well, you know, if we're no longer captive, if we're no longer imprisoned, if there are no rules, then we can do whatever we want. No, that isn't the answer. It's not that we can do whatever we want. So we can do all that God wants because he's the one who's changed us. And we have now become people of faith. We are now people who are baptized into Christ. We are now sons of God and have a relationship with him. We are now spirit filled. We are now Abraham's kids. We are now one in Christ. We have now put on Christ. We are now heirs of the promise. And Abraham's kids don't need law. It doesn't mean there's no commandments. I'm not trying to say that. But that their method of reaching God is not by obedience. Okay? I'm not sure if we're making sense yet, but stay with me, okay? We still tend to want to treat people like we're under law because that's the easiest way to control behavior. I'll tell you what you can do and I'll tell you what you can't do. And that's the way we want to treat people, but that is not what God's trying to do. So there is a place where things fit, just so you understand and maybe to summarize where we've been. There is a place for law. And that's when there's a great deal of immaturity and nobody has a relationship with God and we don't know what to do and so the person has to say, yeah, do this, don't do that. Uh, Don't touch the stove. But it is a lot of immaturity and as kids grow up, we tend to trust them more. You know what dad wants. We allow you to make decisions on your own when you know what the parents want and you're able to decide those things for yourself. Same with God. If you still are at the stop it stage in your Christianity, then you've never gotten beyond law. If you still have to have people come to you and say, don't do this anymore, then that's where you are. There is a place for principle as well. To understand the why, because that seems to help us in obedience to God. Because when we understand the principle, now we're able to see why we would want to do those things. And why God wants us to do that. Faith doesn't always require a why, but it seems to help if we understand what it is we're doing. And the third one is there's a place for faith. And so faith allows us to enter into grace. Law does not allow us to enter into grace. Principle does not allow us to enter into grace. And what happens is we start out with laws and said, okay, do this, don't do this, here's the laws, and and you're supposed to do all these, even in church. Here's the laws of the church. What are the things we have to do? And you get told that. Here's the laws you have to do. Okay. 
And then we finally figure out there are principles that are bigger. That's why they said don't do those things. And we think we have come so far because, man, we're working on principles now. But I think there's a bigger step. And I think that's where a lot of us came to because earlier it got defined so much as law and so much as obedience and do this and don't do this that when we finally got to principle and understanding that and said, you know what, that we're not saved by law or by works or by doing, and we have all these great principles and we'll just keep these principles, but Jesus never said, follow my principles. He did say, follow me. We do see Jesus as he redefines what some of the laws were in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 21, don't murder. The principle is I don't want you to be angry or call everybody names. Don't commit adultery. I don't want you to lust. I don't want you to try to lust. If your right eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out. It's a principle, okay? He's not literal, and please don't do it now. Uh, tell the truth always is in verse 33. You don't need to swear by anything. Just tell the truth. Retaliations in verse 38. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We love that. Well, until it's the other guy doing it to us, and then, wait a minute, we want grace. But he says, give to the one who demands from you. That's a bigger principle. Principles are not easier. Sometimes principles are harder just because it's a principle. Jesus isn't advocating obeying principle. When you get to Jeremiah 31, and I'm sorry I'm having to crunch this so much, he says, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to write my law in their hearts. I'm going to put it in their mind. And he fills us with the Holy Spirit, and he says, I'm going to be within them. And as you look at the covenant that was promised by Jeremiah and is later repeated in Hebrews 8. He says, you're all going to know the Lord. And you don't even have to have somebody teach you. We are all his people and God will be merciful. And we will all know the Lord as we come into this situation of having this great faith in God and being able to believe and trust in God. And so that's where I think God is headed with all of this. But how does all of this work? So let me tell you this illustration. We're still on the stove. Law says, don't touch that stove. Look at that. He's at it again. It's about what you are doing. And so we try to stop them by saying, you know, don't do that. We'll stop the behavior. It will burn you. It will hurt. There are consequences, and we do this with all kinds of things. And a lot of times, that's our approach to Christianity. Don't do that. There are consequences. It will hurt you. Don't eat from that fruit in a tree. And then the child touches it, and the stove isn't on. He goes, wait a minute. They said this would burn me. And it's not burning me at all. I don't even see. I don't even feel any heat here so the child doesn't believe you anymore. But why did you put that thing in there in the first place? Well, you put it in there so you could burn your children, right? So the principle is the stove is hot, it's going to burn, you don't touch, and that's the reason why you would do that. And we put it in here because we wanted a huge piece of machinery that would allow us to burn children at will. And by the way, it's just so we'll see whether you obeyed. Because if you have burn marks on your hands, we're going to know that you disobeyed. That isn't why it's there. Even when you have law and when you have principle, you do not have the fullness of God. There is something much bigger. And that something is called faith. Because the man of God acts, and he uses what's available to bring blessing. It works like this. 
I want you to touch the stove. I want you to use the power of this stove. There are some places that are too hot to touch, and I want you to use those places that are too hot to touch for something that is good. Am I making sense? It's a whole other dimension that we have not reached into that says faith says there is something bigger than this. We can use this too hot to touch and starve. Or we can use the too hot part and turn it on on purpose and get something delicious. It's understanding how to use a hot stove and exploring all the blessings of the covenant. And if your stove doesn't get hot, you want to fix it. Because after all, then we have no threat against our kids that you'll get burnt. So we fix it so that now there's a real threat again. All right, let me see if we can put this together. If we only stick to commands of law, we will miss the blessings of God. We will miss the new covenant. We will miss being a man of faith, able to act. And we will just be trying to do what everybody else has already done. That is not faith. Because God leads us into doing other things. Jesus even said, you're going to do greater things than I do. He wants that. He's leading you that. But there's a huge trust issue. So let me just, I need to stop here. But this is a whole thing just to try to grab this. So there are giants in the land. The law says don't kill. I am not morally responsible. I'll just wait him out. Maybe somebody else will go fight. But that's the law. The principle is, we need to deliver our nation, but that guy's really big. And we could lose. And if we lose, the disaster could be huge. And the man of faith says, how dare you? How dare you defy the armies of a living God? I'll take my stone and do it. I don't know why it takes five, but David walks out with five stones. He says, I'll take care of this. God works through him to deliver his nation. It is all important that he breaks law. Well, not really. It's, you know, you're not supposed to murder. Well, you know, if he threatens you, then it's okay. Well, no, we're at war. And we're not even getting into that whole thing. But here's where he is. Sometimes it is important that God delivers and that the man of faith acts. And he acts in a way that is beyond everything else. And sometimes that's the only solution is to move the mountain is to say there's something else that needs to happen. I saw this, I like the saying, the man on the top of the mountain didn't fall there. Somewhere you have to climb up. Sometimes there's water that needs to be walked on and sometimes there's people that need to be reached and Jesus sends out people of faith. Not people of law and not people who know the principles. But men of faith brothers and sisters, if we're ever going to reach the world, it will not be because we know all the laws in the book. It will not be because we know all the principles in the book. It will only be when they see a man of faith who is able to act on the blessings of God and able to be seen in these huge Tremendous blessings that God has for his people. Yet sometimes we sit here so small saying, yeah, we got to be afraid of that stove. Don't let anybody over there. Somebody go cook. Well, we got to get out of here first or you're never going to get lunch. So maybe you're here today and you need this call of God to be a man of faith. We want to help you do that. Would you come while we stand and sing?